I don't believe anybody's online, but welcome to uh, another edition of The Journey. It might just be us, but I'm recording it for, for future um, study and, and everything. And we are talking today about First Timothy. And we're going to have a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of it. And I'm going to apologize now, but man, my eyes are watering. Something has got me this morning with allergies. And so I've, I've been putting them in and putting them in and it's just not, so it's just this eye, I'm just weepy. So uh, it's an emotional day. <laughs> We're going to be reading about First Timothy. And um, the last time when we met, we read through Titus. Um, and then I told you all that uh, these are the pastoral epistles, remember? Um, uh, that these three are considered widely uh, by a lot of scholars as not from Paul's hand. They were probably more likely written um, in the, the late first to second century. So that being the case, um, it definitely wouldn't have been Paul um, writing um, uh, these things. Um, but they're written some, with some similar style. Um, and um, First Timothy um, is really, uh, a lot of people believe, actually comes after Second Timothy. So while we're only, while they're numbered one and two, that's just to let people delineate between the two different letters, not necessarily a chronological ordering of them. And as well, the Bible is not listed chronologically anyway. So... Um, Chip told us that there were actually four letters to Timothy and that he thought these were like two and four or... Uh, yeah, I've read in other places too that there were, you know, multiple letters were written. I mean, even like to Thessalonians and, and Colossians. I mean, just all the different letters that we have, it's not really known which one they are. This would not have been the first letter. Um, what we do know is that in, in that, that phrase pastoral epistles or pastoral letters um, has to do with descriptions of how church leaders should be and how um, a church governance or polity should um, be run. And so that's why these three letters are important is because they give a lot of insight to that. Um, they also give a lot of insight to other issues uh, uh, as well as we're going to discover today. Now, I'm uh, reading from two different Bibles, actually. Uh, one is The Message by Eugene Peterson, and I'll invite anybody that, uh, that has just a, a book off the shelf here, if you want to read that. It's a, it's a modern-day translation um, written a little bit more in story format. Um, uh, that is a book that I, I go to a lot of times when I am... Um, reading through scripture, trying to figure out a sermon to write, and I'll just say, well, let me see what's in this, because this is a modern translation. It's written a little bit, that you lose the numbers in it if you're off to the side, so you really have to read it more like a story, um, which I think is quite lovely, and they also give some really good um, introductions as well. Um, and then the other book that I'm going to be reading from is uh, the New Testament, which is backwards on the screen, apparently, um, which is by uh, Norm Beck, and... Uh, Pick that up at all your favorite bookstores. Um, he was my professor at Texas Lutheran, as I talked about last time. And, um, and I want to share with you a little bit of insights that he has before we get going about the, um, the nature of, um, uh, of this, this letter. Um, We're going to get to a, uh, oh, and by the way, there's going to be noise in the background because BBS is going on, and uh, uh, so kids are going to be running back and forth um, as well as they should. Uh, so uh, Norm Beck thinks that this letter kind of reaches to the outer edges of what <coughs> Paul would have been writing. That this is very outskirts, so he doesn't believe Paul wrote this one bit. Um, and in fact, um, the, the concept of good works becomes like this way of people that they're supposed to be. Um, and you'll see that as we read through there, kind of like these are, these are ways for you to be, not, uh, not necessarily to achieve salvation or anything of that, to that extreme, but how we should be acting um, in, in accordance to being with good works. Paul would have probably, uh, he says Paul would have denounced this vehemently 
yeah. uh, much of what has been written here, um, which I think is really cute. Um, uh, so there's also, um, uh, not only is there a shift from this conversation about what God's grace is, uh, but there is um, an expression that, that is written in here about um, women. And uh, we're going to have a good time having a conversation about that. Uh, last, last week when we met, I said there was a section in Titus that was probably added later. Um, this one, it, it, well, there's thought that it was probably added later uh, uh, because it's, it's written by... Um, um, uh, well, he, he actually, you know, just quite out of calls him a misogynist. Um, and, and there's a very sexist segment in here as well from um, 2, verses 2, 11 through 3, 1. And remember last week when uh, I said it was in small print um, uh, from Titus, it was a little section that we thought didn't belong in there. The same thing holds true here. He puts this in smaller print for us. Um, and, um, and, and I read through it both with it and then without it, and looked at how these things relate to each other, and I found it to be much more cohesive without it, um, because it just, it's just glaring. Um, it seems to be something that was uh, absolutely added in that, uh, um, that doesn't really uh, help the, the nature of the letter. Um, it speaks with a contrary to what Paul said. So, we all are reading that right now. Taking out that little section there. It's a beautiful nugget, and we'll get to it, I'm sure. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, do what we did last week. Um, it's, it's, this this uh, is only about six chapters. It's about six chapters long, um, so it shouldn't take us long to actually read through the whole thing. Um, and, and remember that the background of this is to talk about what it means to be a leader in the church and what it means to be the church itself. Um, so that's kind of what the focus is around this. Um, and then there's going to be some good conversations about the role of, of women according to this one author here. So who would like to start reading First Timothy? Go ahead. Paul, an epistle, epistle, apostle. What's an epistle? Oh, that's what you're talking about. That's right. And an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than drive training that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from pure heart a good conscience, and sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, or, but for the lawless and disobedient for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel, glorious gospel of our blessed God, which he entrusted to me. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy that so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal and visible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 
I am giving you these instructions tonight. Too, we'll pause. We'll pause right there because uh, that, no, that's really. Thank you. Um, I, I want to. This next. This next part will transition into into section two, uh, because right here it really it's it's really more of an extended greeting. Right, you have that very very beginning that you hear in a lot of different letters, but it's here at this beginning that we start to get a sense that this is not um, from um, Paul's hand. Okay, um, and that's because the language and the um, and the tense that's being used here wasn't the same. So that's how they, they would determine some of these things is that they, they would recognize um, the unusual features uh, that, that he would be doing here. Um, so, so the section at 12 where it's in first person from Paul, mm -hmm. I'm grateful and I was a sinner, uh -huh. etc. So do you think they took sections? Whoever did put this together? Well, no, no. Sections of his writing or? I think they, they, they had his writing, right? I think they've had, they've seen letters, so they, they, they recognize this. In other words, they're writing in the style of Paul, in honor of Paul, um, uh, to, to, to create and establish a way of being church, um, to, uh, to establish leadership in the church. Um, but that this would come directly from Paul to Timothy, probably not, is, is the thing. So, which is difficult. Right, it's difficult because then all of a sudden we're studying something. We're like, okay, but is this real? Who really wrote this, right? And why did they write it? And who are they writing it to? And is it a translation? And is it a, yeah? Yes. And how did they translate it? Or is it a translation of, a, of another letter that was written that somebody else wrote? But the reason why they don't think the reason why a lot of scholars there are some that think that yes, this is from the hand of Paul, uh, no doubt. Um, uh, regardless of what archaeological dating, carbon dating, all that kind of stuff. No, it doesn't matter. They're going to believe that it comes from that. There also, there's also a school of thought that's going to believe every single thing that it says in here is absolutely how it should be. And I'm, we're going to find out if y'all do um, in just a minute. Um, and I'm going to probably think you don't um, because I'm in a room of women and it's going to be very interesting, uh, uh, which is it's, it's totally fine. But like uh, in 1-1, in one one, um, even the phrase uh, to the command um, or by the command, I don't know which version you have there. Um, that phrase, do you have something different in the message? In one, in one, one? Yeah, one, one. By Paul and Apostle, on a special assignment for Christ, our living hope. Okay, a special assignment, right? Um, uh, this is an interesting that, but, word. Oh, well, this is beautiful. Isn't, that, isn't, it, isn't it great? It's awesome. Yeah, I really love that. I love how he, he translates that. But even that, this, 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 this command was not something that Paul had ever used. It wasn't familiar with anything. In fact, the only other place we find similar phrases like that is in Titus, right? So there, I mean, so already, so, so in other words, if we have question if Titus belongs or not, well then, then all of a sudden we recognize this has similarities to Titus. So then again, um, you have the word our savior um, uh, in here, uh, 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 the command of God, our savior and of Christ, our hope. Um, in, in one, three, uh, oh, hang on, I'll get back to that one. But so, um, it's this, not like the beginnings of his other letters. Exactly, it isn't like the beginnings of, well, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, the, uh, it's good to see you. Just to let you know, we're doing First Timothy. Um, and we just read verses uh, chapter 1, 1 through 18, and we're discussing how um, Timothy is probably not um, a letter that was written by Paul um, and giving some examples about why that wouldn't be. So, well, it was obviously written, though, by somebody who felt that there was a need for some instruction about how the church should work. Right, and 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 I think that's that's a, they're writing it in the style of Paul, which would have been you know received as authoritative, as right. you know ordained, if if you will. Do you think Timothy could have written this letter to well, himself? It, it's possible, or Timothy could. It, this this might not have even been you know. Um, of course, it's only titled you know um, uh, one Timothy or, or you know uh, first Timothy because of just the nature of, the, of who this letter was attached to. Um, it could have been. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's unknown, I guess. 
but words like our savior um, appear only in first Timothy and, 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 and like our hope um, as well. It, it appears in very little letters and stuff. So there's some clues that this has mature, mature -er language. Okay. That's the point is that the concepts of even uh, some, some eschatological concepts or, or end time concepts or hope and, and, um, or, or um, salvation concepts that come out of first Timothy were not part of Pauline thought earlier on. So already right there, there's some clear delineation that whoever wrote this had a much um, a deeper theology, if you will, or a much later theology or deeper understanding of what, uh, of what Paul might have been saying earlier. And instead of trying to copy Paul's style, uh, it kind of slipped up in a sense in, in, in that now all of a sudden relating the concept of Savior and hope and those types of things that weren't written about in these other areas. Well, he's using Paul's style, but he's using the wrong words. Well, yes, or he thinks, or yes, and maybe he's using the, the right words for him. Maybe this, you know, uh, again, remember, plagiarism back then, writing in the style of somebody else, was it was an honor. It wasn't something that people looked down on or that they were like, I can't believe you would produce this letter. This is not you. This was seen as, no, this is an honor of Paul, um, um, of the theology that I've learned from him. Um, so, and again, remember that language like this is only really found in um, a very few sparse places throughout the New Testament, but mostly in 2 Timothy and Titus. All right. Um, and so, uh, I want to I want to jump to the very end here at, at verse 18. Um, and, and there's a lot of authority that, that's given to this person that's leading this, right? Uh, you, you already see that quite a bit. Um, uh, I am trustworthy, or you can trust these words. Or, and now um, in verse 18, we're going to be hearing about some other people. Um, and then we're going to listen to him talk about um, uh, how to be the church. And we're going to hear about different ways and different leaders and how those leaders are supposed to act and and, and roles for men and women, and um, we shall see where the conversation will go with that. So uh, let's have somebody else begin at verse 18, and I might stop right at the very end of that just to talk about these people real quick. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in their faith. Among them are Ananias and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to bless me. All right. But all of a sudden, there's a shift, right? I mean, you can see that there's something that we had this great greeting, this long line of thing. You can trust me. Uh, you know, even this. Uh, this I uh, love verse 17, you know, um, God of all ages, immortal, invisible, God only wise, and you just recognize that hymn there uh, uh, related to this. And then all of a sudden, as your spiritual father, I entrust you with responsibilities in accord with the prophecies that have previously come to you to the fulfillment that you may serve as a good spiritual and mindset strategist, having faith in a good conscience. And then it talks about if you reject this, some people who have been shipwrecked uh, um, among them are Hymenius and Alexander, um, delivering them over to Satan. Um, what in the world is is the writer trying to do here? Shipwreck's little the way it's written here because it's really interesting. tell us it made a big difference. There are some, you know, who by relaxing their grip and thinking anything goes have made a mess of their faith. Hymenius and Alexander are two of them. I let them wander off to Satan to be taught a lesson or two about not blaspheming. <laughs> so in other words, allowing them to do whatever it is that they're yeah. doing so that way they, they have yeah, a chance so to learn. Word. So the shipwreck is a little. Right, okay, so it's a shipwreck of their faith. Right. So in other words, if, if a ship crashes on the shore, all of a sudden you're broken and it might take right. a long time to, to you know deal with that, um, but it's only temporary from the community. All right, so, so another, there's, there's still there's still wander. grace, right? Yeah, they let them wander off to right. learn the foolishness of their ways, essentially. Right, and what one author says is that this is this is setting it up so that way um, uh, Timothy's job is to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. Hence the rest of this letter. 
Okay. So he must know this Hymenius and Alexander. Well, they might have been definitely famous people um, or well-known people. That's what I, I'm guessing because okay. I don't recognize the names and, and I believe anybody else. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a very, very different. So now we're going to get into chapter. Well, it has that feel to it, doesn't it? Um, and of course, they would, they would know these stories, right? This, yeah. um, uh, uh, by this point in time, Mark, well, by this point in time, if this happens, you know, when they say it did, all the Gospels would have been down, written down. So, you know, and definitely Mark would have been shared verbally. All right, we're going to go to chapter two, and we're going to go two through ten, and then we're going to pause before we jump ahead. So anybody want to read? Sure. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Four, there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and trust. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothes, not, without, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. And then 10, right? Yes, but with up. good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. All right, so there, there, in, there in line, that, that, that verse 10 would be something that Paul probably would not have said. Um, not, not even about women, but just the nature of good works. But, but express themselves through good works, which is proper for women professing reverence to God. Um, so we're beginning to see descriptions on how people should behave in, in the assembly here. Um, you know, there's a lot here that evangelicals have plucked out. Oh, sure. That with the hands raised, holy hands raised, which you see a lot in their services and their hands up and praying. But the whole thing about dressing modestly and decently and not with expensive clothes. I mean, the evangelicals have plucked a lot right out of here. What um, what do you think is being, is being offered here in this concept of uh, decency and, and, and the like and modesty? Because those are some interesting words that mean a lot right now to us in the 21st century. What, 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 what does Eugene Peterson say over there? Well, uh, two, two eight to two ten. Since prayer is at the bottom of all this, what I wanted mostly is for men to pray, not shaking angry fists at enemies, but raising holy to God. And I want women to get in there with the men in humility before God, not crimping before a mirror or chasing the latest fashions, but doing something beautiful for God and becoming beautiful by doing it. That's really, really a neat translation here. I like those words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's this concept back then of like extravagance, that things that people were doing in extravagance and everything, um, whether it's jewelry or dress, um, was, was um, they, they say here, uh, may simply allude to a traditional ethical maxim, or it may imply the presence of wealthy women who are coming to the assembly inappropriately dressed. Um, um, so coming with, you know, for, for that seat of honor, or for the attention, or whatever the case might be. Um, and I remember one woman um, who, had, who is deceased, so she won't be watching this video on YouTube, I'm sure, but, um, uh, it would always come to church with this big hat every Sunday, a different hat every Sunday, expensive hats. I mean, just, I mean, this is, this is, you know, Alvin, Texas and a 
Um, we were not a rich congregation by any means, but they were definitely a wealthy family. And she had the big tip, tilted hats and stuff with all the stuff on top of it. And they always sat in front of us and I could never see around her. <laughs> but I saw every hat. And I always thought it was amazing. It was very extravagant and stuff. Now, is that wrong? I don't think it's wrong. Wear whatever you want to wear. However, if that's what you're doing is to receive, to receive something beyond that, then all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes about the self, not about the other. Um, I'm a firm believer that God wants us to be spiritually, mentally, physically fit, um, and, and that that has the ability to attract people to faith, but it, that also, also has the ability to attract people to the self, um, and that you can absolutely be used as um, um, self-stimulating, um, um, self-praise, that type of thing. So that there, there in line, there lies the, the rub, right? Um, and so I think, to me, this is what this author is, or this, this letter writer is speaking to here. Um, I'm curious about the, the braided hair. I understand the rest of it is being calling attention, but I, I was wondering if anybody knew. Well, I have, with braiding hair. I have a reference that, that I read last night, and it says mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. at the time, braiding of the hair was a newly Roman kind of mm. um, way to wear your hair. And that most of the women in that area either wore their hair down or pulled it up like in a bun or coiled it around their heads, but they didn't braid it. So braiding and what you could do with braiding I mean, there's some amazing stuff out there if you look at what people have done to braid their hair. But braiding is a way to kind of say, here I am, look at me. Adorn yourself. Adorn myself. Yeah. yeah well, and I think, I think uh, I've heard that too. I can't find it anywhere in here, but about the, the Roman reference or the Greco Roman world. Um, it's you're more making yourself attuned to the, to the ways of the world instead of to what God has asked you to be. Now, but it's also kind of coming from the hand of a man. Um, that is writing this, and now we're about to see some, some um, definite darkness in, in some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to read you my version, and I want to hear what you're saying. Where are you starting? I'm at verse 11, and I'm going to read all the way to 3.1, and then we'll back up and do some things. It is my personal opinion that a woman should learn in silence with respect for the authority of others. I personally do not permit a woman to teach a man nor to exercise authority over a man. I want a woman to express reverence for God in silence. For according to the creation story, Adam was formed first, then Eve was formed. And according to that story, Adam was not the one who was deceived. The woman was the one who, having been deceived, became the leader in transgression. But in my opinion, the woman of a family shall be able to attain redemption through the bearing of children, if the children remain in the faith and in love and holiness, conducting themselves with decency. What I have said is trustworthy. Okay, so that right there is uh, um, uh, a snippet that seems out of context for what's being written here. And it's also written from a hand that this would not be something that Paul would say. People have argued about Paul and, and language toward women. I'm not going to discount that, but this seems to be so far on the different extreme here. Does anybody have any different translation here or anything pop out at you as I was reading that um, you want to look up? Again, this here. I don't let women take over and tell the men what to do. They should study to be quiet and obedient along with everyone else. So this kind of... Okay, so they're kind of, it, it seems to me like that's, that's a softening, right it's a softening of some of that stuff. Adam was made first, then Eve. Woman was, was deceived first. Our pioneer in sin, with Adam right on her heels. On the other hand, her childbearing brought about salvation, reversing Eve. But this salvation only comes to those who continue in faith, love, and holiness, gathering it in all maturity. You can depend on this. You can depend on this. So uh, that's a definitely kind of, uh, you can see there's some liberation that was taken with his translation of this. Um, to soften that, and um, I don't know how I feel about that, but it's, well, it's been done, which is totally fine. Yes, there's also an interesting in the in this Lutheran Study Bible, the punctuation is interesting. Okay, 
because it ends verse 15, yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty, period. Then it says in chapter three, the saying is sure, colon, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task, which says to me that the saying is sure does not relate to the previous verse. And it doesn't say, it doesn't say this saving is sure, meaning the holiness and modesty and all mm -hmm. of the stuff before. He now switches gears. Mm -hmm. He's through talking about women and he says, the saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task, which means I think that's also the, the whoever whoever translated in that one. That's the NRSV, um, I, I believe, correct? Right. And that translation there, then that's how they 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 figured out the punctuation for that. And again, that's a guessing game sometimes too. Because so, it says that some put this saying at the end of the previous at the end chapter. Of, right. Yeah. Right. So. Um, but I just think that's really. I mean, it's kind of really very well, interesting. Yeah, and, and it's also interesting too that this has been related to Adam and Eve, right? And and the author here is taking a literal approach to Adam and Eve's story. Is is that the proper use of that scripture? Um, uh, saying it's all Eve's fault, and in fact, you know that there's nothing that she can do except for have children, and the only way that she can be saved is by the decency of the children. If the children have, if the children live good faith, so. Sorry. That's all right. Um, is that concept of, question, um, is the concept of um, only the, sorry, I just lost my place. The um, woman will be saved if the children are good kids um, is, that unique to First Timothy, or is that concept found other places? Um, I think that was a cultural concept, um, but and, and apparently the the author that I have here is Norm Beck uh, in his translation, and he says that uh, um, by by taking the Genesis story very literally and only literally, literally the inspired male chauvinist who wrote this section decided that Eve, having been deceived, became the leader in sin. Um, so clearly this, if, if I was to, if I was to, you know, place a bet or take a claim on this, it would be that Paul didn't write this, that somebody else wrote this and put this in about the nature of women in worship, because you'll see later on that women are claimed to be deacons or, or, uh, um, not elders, but, uh, yeah, deacons, um, or, or, or the like as we, as we move through here, um, and that they're not supposed to teach others, but yet they're supposed to teach children. You know, and so it's like there's some contradiction in some of the, the language here. So all of a sudden, this little section here, um, it seems to be very off-putting. Um, because, no, Amy, I don't think that this was something that, um, it definitely wasn't anything that the church was necessarily professing. But I think it has added a lot of problems in the church. You What's know, in, um, but isn't there something in Genesis that speaks to... The pain of childbirth and birth. right. Well, that comes after the the fall, right? After they they eat of the, of the fruit right. of the knowledge of the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That um, then they then they hide. You know, of course, the, the snake tells or the, the serpent tells Eve. Eve eats of it. Uh, Eve tells Adam. Adam eats of it. Um, um, and I love the whole thing. Like, well, they tempted. You know, they deceived. And I was like, well, they they took it. They took the bite. So own your behavior, right? You know, <laughs> you did it. Own your stuff. Uh, uh, um, uh, but then afterwards, they're hiding and they make the fig clothing and fig leaf clothing, and, and then God comes through the garden. Where are you? And why are you hiding? And then they they admit what they you know. Oh, you caught us. You know that kind of thing. And then God you know tells the serpent that you'll you know be on your belly and and, and, and curse and heals and all that kind of stuff. And that one will have pain in childbirth and that type of thing. And a lot of people look at um, the, the creation stories as ways to explain where things came from. I mean, uh, and, and there's two different creation stories that we have in scripture and, 
and then, and, and in fact, the second one uh, actually comes before the first one, kind of like Timothy. Um, uh, so, but there's two different two different ways. One, it's it's, it's man, man then woman. The other one, it's both. And our likeness is is one, and and another one, the dust of the ground and stuff. So, I mean, there's if if, if those are the things, how how are we supposed to take those things such so literally? When it's talking about humanity's brokenness and God's constant love, so much so that that uh, um, uh, we're not we're not going to you know die immediately for disobeying, um, we're just not going to receive that that uh, the eternal life in, in this plane, but something else to come. Um, so they know all those stories. Yeah, well, well, clearly they know. Well, but, but in the time period that this was written, what would they know? Well, they would have had this information. Of it. I mean, this yes, they would have known this. Um, if since, they were Jewish, well, or or Gentile, even because I mean, these stories would have been would have been all over the place, you know, by this point in time as well. Um, uh, it, it's it's um, it's a thought from a lot of scholars that uh, the Old Testament and its com compilation of it thereof and, and uh, um, it was around the time of Ezra and, and Nehemiah after the, the people were returning from exile um, um, and and as those things got written down and shared with each other um, uh, more and more people would have had um, the ability to, to have access to this, especially the first five books uh, of the Bible, um, which it, of course included the creation stories. Um, so, the history of, of, the, of the Jewish, you know, the faith of the Israelites of the wandering, um, uh, then all of a sudden got started to be added on to with, with, with others. By the time you get to even this this letter, you know, which could have been well after the Gospel of John was written. Um, well, after Paul had passed away almost a hundred years, um, by the time this was written, it would have been these these things would have been known um, because we're we're also talking about a, a house church, right? We're talking about this being written to a group of people that are worshiping in a, in a, in a house, you know. So um, they're talking about the different leaders that are going to that are going to be uh, raised up in those different places. And if they are, if this is a church, this meeting in house, then they would have access to. They would be aware of um, uh, the, the Torah. I mean, this would have been part of their faith because it's it's where they came from. I mean, it's, well, but are these Jews or Gentiles? I would say yes. <laughs> Both, right? Well, they're right. Gentiles, but you can't accept Christ without accepting some of his history. I mean, his history. His well, history is from the Jewish. So I'm not saying they had to convert to Judaism, but they had to accept, and just as we do, this, well, this teaching. Well, absolutely. I mean, you could think about it. You know, you have, there's been a constant shift all throughout, you know, humanity of, of coming to a new understanding of our relationship with God um, and, and, and how we reconcile those things, even from Adam and Eve or even from Abraham. And then you have Moses. All of a sudden, the people are wandering in the wilderness. They have to change their identity from multiple gods in Egypt, in Egypt and everything to one god. And that was difficult for them to do to the point that they even made a calf because they resorted back to the ways that they, that they knew, what they knew to be true. I mean, good Lord, how many of us have ever done that? Have you ever said, I'm never going to do that again? And then the next day you're like, ah, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> you know, I mean, we do that all the time. Um, and, and, I, and so then you have, you know, these people that are wandering out in the wilderness um, they don't even make it to the promised land, right? Um, it's it's uh, it's it's the it's the the next generation that that gets on there, and then all of a sudden, Jesus, you know, years later, Jesus comes onto the scene, and now he's transitioning and 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 reclaiming the originality of this law that was given through through Moses, through the prophets, um, and reinterpreting it. And it's and and the temple elite and the leaders at the time um, are, are that, that that's that's not how they understand this. That's not how they interpret. Um, and um, all of a sudden, now you have these these ragtag followers that are in this movement that's starting to follow Jesus, and it's this change in, of, of identity, of of what it means to be a, a follower of, of God, a follower of the, the Son of God, of, of being of, of having the Spirit within you. Um, that all of a sudden, 
this concept that, that God was in a temple had shifted from God is everywhere to now God is with us in person, Emmanuel. I mean, people are, the, the, minds are, the minds are definitely changing. And so how they understand that is changing. But Jesus would, you know, uh, uh, he preached and taught from the Old Testament. Which because meant, there wasn't, he wasn't preaching from the Gospels, right? I mean, he was Jewish. So they, they were Jewish, they were Jewish followers that now were following the anointed one. They were following Christ. They were following Emmanuel. And all of a sudden that meant that their identity had to change. And they, they resisted that even to the point of denying. To the well, and there had to be denying. some teaching going on because he quotes the law and the prophets throughout his teaching. And when he's speaking to the Jews, they understand what he's saying because they know the prophets and the laws. But the Gentiles don't. So to them, this is kind of all like, what? Well, you know, it, like, I, you I know and so there has to be some teaching going on that says, and when Jesus says this, he's quoting the prophet yeah, I think that, I think that that might that, that might have been happening, sure. Um, but I also think that back then the the education of people was was pretty deep too, in, in the sense of um, I, I think that Gentile that, that that even that terminology itself was not Jewish. I mean, so that's wide open, right? It's wide open. So um, and those 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 um, those followers of Christ, um, even all throughout Acts and and um, uh, uh, I mean, even in the first, you know, letters that, that Paul is writing to Thessalonians and Corinthians and Romans, um, that it's being written to all. And you can even see Jesus' ministry shift in the Gospels to in, in inclusivity of, of, of not only Jews, but Gentiles uh, um, um, as well. And so the, the teaching um, would not necessarily change from, from I, don't, I don't believe, from between Jews and Gentiles, they'd be receiving anything different. Um, it's the inclusion of them. Um, that to me is, is the important piece here, which is interesting because this is exclusive and how it talks about women, which would not necessarily have been the case. And it definitely wouldn't have been something that Paul would have written. Um, but this, it wasn't something that Jesus did either. No, and I mean, in, in the way that Jesus treated women um, and, and the stories that we have of women um, uh, and, and, the, and the leadership that came from women throughout the New Testament, even the Old Testament too, um, is is really amazing and profound. Um, they were the first apostles, right? They were the first ones that that came to the to the tomb, and they were the ones that went and told the good news that Jesus is risen. So I mean, even from the onset, that that would have even been included would be would be huge if this is the case. If women are supposed to be silent, this was clearly written from somebody that had a had a, had a thing had a bad experience somewhere somehow some way and not um, want to let it go and. Um, uh, or it's their, their own interpretation and, and for whatever purpose. I mean, I have this one author I'm reading from too is trying to, trying to, trying to say, you know, it, it may be okay that this was written this way. And I'm like, you know, maybe it's not. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's some, some good that we can pull out of this, but I think that's also um, a very uh, dangerous way of reading the text too, because it says what it says. It's, to me, it's somewhat clear about it. The way that, that the way that yours is translated over there, it seems very soft, and almost kind of like let's uh, let's just get past this. Um, but and, he's trying to make the best of a bad deal, I think. Well, I think it may be so. Don't think you going to say something there, <laughs> please. Having grown up Missouri Center, uh huh, <laughs> I see this that it's possible this is where they took their women. Mm -hmm. To not teach because you couldn't teach. Well, you could up to fifth grade, but sixth grade no higher, and women could not be at the altar area except maybe to set something on it. Um, well, they could do. They could be altar guilds, right? Yes. And get everything ready. Yes. But as far as being able to speak and get there, like you said, there are women who were leaders in the home churches. Prior to this, right, and it's clear that and as we read on, we're going to find more and more of that uh, as well. Um, go ahead, you can have more. Am I understanding that it says 
and yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue. Who continues? The children. And these children didn't continue. Nah, I know, right away. They had, they had some issues right away, didn't they? Yeah. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So okay. in spite of Adam and Eve's bad example. Yeah, Cain, Cain and Abel, you know. <laughs> so they were not saved. No. Well, that's just it to think about it. I mean, that this concept that that you're 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 ruined and there's no way of getting around it. it, it you know, it's up to somebody up your kids. Now, the salvation that comes in, in, in our being saved is it's not contingent on my will or 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 your will on my behalf. Um, and in fact, if I'm not mistaken, that was a big issue with Martin Luther and and some of the letter writing that was going on around with indulgences that there was somehow some way you could do somebody else. We'll take care of your salvation on, on their behalf. Oh, yeah, you can save those people of yours that are hanging around in limbo. That's right. You can right. buy an indulgence, buy, buy their way out and get them to heaven. And, and, you know, but it's really interesting because if you think about the meaning of this, that women are saved because they're saved through the pain of their childbearing if their children continue on in good ways. The minute that kid goes astray, the woman well, is, is useless. Well, doesn't say anything doesn't about, about men. Well, it doesn't say anything about the child either. You know, so it doesn't say anything about what happens to that child. All of a sudden, it resorts back to this woman. So clearly, it's a male, it's okay. well, and, but so clearly, this was written by a man. And that there was a, an authoritative you know, aspect to it. That's very pretty. Right. Because mm -hmm. with Freud, everything was false to work. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, but then what about the women who do not bear children? Well, they're not saved because they weren't saved through the pain of childbirth. So Which this is, little section here, of course, we, we could spend all day. Right, and I think, and I think we totally could, and, we're, and we are, which is beautiful. But let's now let's now shift yeah. gears. And let's see what Timothy now speaks to, because this is First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are used in, in um, uh, ordinations um, for you know, pastoral leadership and, and the like, and, and the nature of church in that itself. And here's where we get to some of those things. So let's read three, one, and uh, let's go ahead and just read all of chapter three. Who wants to do that? I'll be reading from this strange from this. Oh, I think it's totally fine. Is that fine? Okay. <laughs> leadership in the church. If anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. But there are three conditions. A leader must be well thought of, committed to his wife, cool and collected, accessible and hospitable. He must know what he's talking about, not be over fine fond of wine, not pushy, but gentle, not thin skinned, not money hungry. He must handle his own affairs well, attentive to his own children, and having their respect. For if someone is unable to handle his own affairs, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a new believer, lest the position go to his head and the devil trip him up. Outsiders must think well of him, or else the devil will figure a way to lure him into his trap. The same goes for those who want to be servants in the church. Serious, not deceitful, not too free with the bottle, not in it for what they can get out of it. They must be reverent before the mystery of the faith, not using their position to try to run things. Let them prove themselves first. If they show they can do it, take them on. No exceptions are to make made for women. Same qualifications, serious, dependable, not sharp tongued, not over fond of wine. Servants in the church are be to be committed to their spouses, attentive to their own children, and diligent in looking after their own affairs. Those who do this servant work will come to be highly respected, a real credit to this Jesus faith. I hope you visit soon, just in case I'm delighted, if you delayed. I'm writing this letter so you'll know how things ought to go in God's household, this God-alive church, bastion of this Christian life is a great mystery, far as sitting our understanding, but some, some things are clear enough. He appeared in a human body, was proved right by the invisible spirit, was seen by angels. 
He was proclaimed among all kinds of peoples, believed in all over the world, taken up into heaven. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. The, uh, the, the word that, that comes out in verse 8 um, and on, whenever you start talking about servants, mine, mine has deacons. Does right. anybody else have, does yours say deacons as well? Deacons. All right. Um, because these are uh, two different, there's three different um, leadership, uh, uh, church offices rather, not leadership, but offices that we're going to be reading about as we continue on. And one is, is bishop or overseer. And what, what did you, I, I can't remember what you said that first three, uh, chapter 3 1. Uh, if anyone desires. Provide leadership in the, if anyone wants to provide leadership in the church. Leadership. So this is just yeah, more. Just leadership in general. Leadership. Well, Does maybe, anybody else have anything else written there? The like overseer leader. or anything? Or bishop? Does yours say anything like that? The translation of bishop is overseer in mine. Okay. So um, th these two things um, come from the, uh, the Greek word episkopos. Um, which I know I'm saying that wrong, and somebody, if they ever watch this on YouTube, will let me know. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, um, uh, of course, you can hear Episcopal in there. Um, uh, but uh, in deacon or a diakonos, um, uh, and then there's also the third one is elder, and um, which that word is presbyteros, Presbyterian elders. Um, so all of the meetings, the these are all the different yeah, well these are just church offices okay, okay. but it's clear that we're that we start to hear about who these um, um, uh, who these are and what the qualifications that they should have and so the first one that we have is this bishop this this leadership position this overseer um, and it's a noble position um, and that it can be you know people can look at it that's okay we're here um, um, and so the qualifications suggest that this person should have administration, teaching, and public relations responsibilities. And it, it, it has a whole host of, of, of a litany of different things that they're supposed to be able to do um, or not do and how they should be. And, and that this is definitely for a man. Okay? So that's, it's clear even in that one that this, the leadership, the bishop role is supposed to be for a man. Um, and, and just just so we're all on the same page that you know this in, in the year 2018 elected our first female bishop in the, in the southwestern Texas Senate and uh, among all the bishops elected I believe six were women um, this year um, and, which is, our and our presiding bishop, bishop is a female which right. I just think is amazing so there's there's that that being said clearly the ELCA um, looks at these uh, looks at this letter as something to think yes this is how the church you know might might function but we're going to take out all the different connotations of male or female and we're just going to put in human right and, and we're just going to be because even how we're married and that type of stuff is different from what this is go ahead so by having the female and and it goes against what this is saying can that be turned against the elca as not following well, I think people people use Timothy all the time. I mean, uh, uh, to argue, you know, different reasons and, and, and stuff. I know there's plenty of other church bodies, and I don't want to talk about them necessarily. But well, even the um, Episcopalians now have they have female bishops, so right? They well, have for a long time. and they have yeah. they have, and there's and there's different different church bodies have different you know reasons for doing such things. Other church bodies read this and they say, no, this is what Scripture says. This is what we will do. And and my feeling is. I choose not to worship at that place because that's not where my faith has been carried. Um, my relationship with my mom and, and seeing leadership growing up and having a, a, a wonderful youth minister that was, that was female, um, um, I saw strong women in leadership positions and it didn't, it didn't deter anything. It wasn't, it wasn't something I was like questioning or, or saying that, you know, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Timothy says something about that. Maybe you shouldn't, you know. It wasn't that case at all. You know, I saw people that, that just had leadership skills and, and God used those people for these different reasons. So we're learning about the different um, offices that would come into these little household churches that, that, that are building up. And number one would be the bishop. The next one that, we're, that we read about is this deacon, which yours said servant, uh, which of course at the end of the day is what a deacon is. Um, we have deacons in the, uh, um, uh, the Lutheran church. Uh, now they're called minister of word and service, servant, right? Uh, so when the service is going on, 
what role? Who is the deacon? The person reading scripture? Well, um, the person serving at the altar. Yeah, the, this is probably somebody much more in in terms of teaching and education um, uh, than than it would have been like the serving the meal or you know that type of uh, or leading the worship service. Well, the first deacons were elected in Acts, and they were supposed to take care of the widows and the children. I mean, Stephen was one of those, and they weren't necessarily teaching at the service. They were out serving. Well, I, no, I was just wondering from looking at the cast of characters in right. uh, service, which is the deacon, or do we have a special ordination for a deacon that did, that changes that from the reader of the scripture to what Oh, the no, not necessarily, no. I mean, if it, it, okay, so if it, well, if we're looking at it from today's perspective, yeah, there, I'm, I'm sorry. I, oh, I mean, sorry, I thought you were asking that. from, from, uh, from this household church perspective. No, here it's, uh, there is a, there is a different ordination uh, for minister of word and service than there is for a minister of word and sacrament. So um, the, the in, in the biggest difference that I could probably tell you is presiding over the meal. Other than that, um, anybody that has word and serve it, and, and, and even then they have the ability to preside over a meal. Um, they're, they're synodically given authority and that type of stuff, but um, it, it would be, they can do everything that a pastor does. But their focus is a lot more on service oriented, uh, much like it would have been here too. It's like, you know, um, this is where they're teaching other people or providing opportunities of service for other people. Um, and it's clear that um, um, even in this, uh, this one right here, that it's um, uh, it's instructed that deacons can be uh, women as well, um, uh, or that the deacons' wives also need to be the same way. But that, that women are included now. All of a sudden, just you know, 10, 10 verses later, all of a sudden now the women are included. In this. Um, does that help answer your question a little bit? Yes, it, but it, a deacon is in the it's, it, my Lutheran ignorance shows it, but. The deacon is not a paid position. Like, well, no, it can be. Okay, so oh. we have, we have, um, um, there's a member of this congregation that served as a deacon to a Lutheran church and was there for, I think, 17 years and for all intents and purposes served as their pastor. But they, he was called deacon. But he met all the ministerial needs they had. Somebody died, he did the funeral, he led worship services on the weekends and that type of thing. Um, and he's since moved on and does now does other things. But um, um, there are deacons in San Antonio that are ministers of word and service. Um, for some people, that line of work fits much more with who they are and, and what they feel God calling them to be and to do, um, which is different from ordained ministry. Um, so, and they're paid. I mean, yes, and they and they. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Paid. Um, the church I came from in Chicago. Um, had a woman who was interested in doing um, diaphanal service and there was a class offered and the congregation paid her way and she um, became this she was then ordained and put on the staff and served as essentially an assistant minister she and she was usually the assisting minister on Sunday mornings but they also had readers. I'm sorry, and I've really digressed with my questions. That's it's it's okay. It's okay. What I want to do though, and, and because uh, definitely the the ministers of word and service and, and deacons. I mean, it's it's wonderful that we're lifting those those up because this is showing us that there's multiple different ways to be in this the quote office um, and, and in the church. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, we're Lutheran and we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So. I may be set apart to do a certain role and task that doesn't change. That's just set apart, not set apart, right? So all these different things are, are there to uh, providing for, for leadership to go in. What I want to do is I want to um, skip ahead to chapter five. Feel free to read chapter four on your own. Um, uh, it's, 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 uh, um, it's just more about being a servant and then avoiding some things and doing something. But now we're going to get to... Uh, uh, the, the church family as itself um, uh, um, about how um, how they're being charged to do certain things. Um, so does, does somebody want to read? Because we're also going to hear a little bit about widows in here as, as well. I'll read it. Go for it. 
Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as a father, to younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, to younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Honor widows who are really widows. If a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn their religious duty to their own family and make some repayment to their parents, for this is pleasing in God's sight. The real widow, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give these commands as well, so that they may be above reproach. And whoever does not pro provide for relatives, and especially for family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be put on the list if she is not less than 60 years old and has been married only once. She must be well attested for her good works as one who brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to doing good in every way, but refused to put younger widows on the list for when their sensual desires alienate them from Christ, they want to marry. And so they incur, incur condemnation for having violated the first pledge. Beside that, they, are, they learn to be idle, gadding about from house to house. And, when, and they are not merely idle, but also gossips and busy, busy bodies saying what they should not say. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their house, households so as to give the adversary no occasion to revile us. For some have already turned away to follow Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are really widows, let her assist them. Let the church not be burdened so that it can assist those who are real widows. That's but, great. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just, just like, it's a, it's a hard lot. time it's, it's a, keeping from laughing. Right. All right. So there's an awful lot here that's given descriptions about um, the nature of the widow um, in the church. It is really raining here. Um, and you can hear it outside quite a bit. Um, and it's clear that the author here. Um, it might be the guy that wrote the other part. Well, it, 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 who knows? But um, um, the. Uh, I can't help but think this person looks at the widow and as a burden on the church. And that the like, church. Like it's her fault her husband died? Um, well, no, no, I mean like the church has to do things for these widows. Has to. Yeah. They're dependent, they're dependent on the church. So, so if they have kids, let them be dependent on their kids. But if they're a true widow, then, then sure. But if they're a young widow, tell them to go get married, have more kids. You know? Don't be a fan. Yeah. for a long time. Right. In the church. Right. So. Um, we'd, be a, we'd be hard pressed these days with all the young widows there are out there, given our military, military situations. Didn't Paul say, and it may have just been about divorced women, that they should stay that way and not be married, otherwise, it's adultery? Um, that, that's definitely a part of, of somewhere in the Bible that it talks about. There's, there's thought about, you know, like if you're divorced, you should not be married. Because Does it have anything to do with widow? Um, no. Um, uh, I mean, not that, not that I'm aware of. Okay, so the whole concept of marriage in and of itself, that fidelity to one other person, uh, whenever that's caused into suspect that you end up, you know, marrying somebody else or falling in love with somebody else or, you know, whatever the case would be, widow or divorced or anything, um, that was always frowned upon uh, by whomever. Right, I mean, at, at, at the time. Um, but because of the nature of men uh, back then, that people were being. Um, <laughs> we have some little ones Is trying to poke their. Yeah, it's a, it's a VBS kid trying to come into this room. Um, <laughs> with. Uh, uh, I totally lost my thought there, and I apologize. The, uh, Marriage, uh, sure. So Moses gave, made, gave the ability to, to have um, a, a writ of divorce um, because of what was happening to women in the wilderness. They were being sent off to, to die. Um, uh, they didn't have anybody to care for them. So that way the man could marry somebody else or have somebody else. Um, uh, so, and, and, and so to do so, the man, 
Moses said, then, then, then you, there's a piece of paper that returns her back to her family so she can remarry and she, somebody else can take care of her or her father or brothers can take care of her. But when he came to a widow, if they did not have children, they did not have a husband, and they didn't have any family, they were, they were only reliant on the church or the, the temple. Um, and they would have nothing because the temple would be taking their land and all that kind of stuff too. You know, that's one thing Jesus but was. The church was, was told to take care of the widows. Yes, they were told to take care of the widows. So now all of a sudden they're like, but if they got a bunch of kids, you might you know, encourage them to go to the kids. And if they're a young widow, encourage them to go and get married and everything. You know, So this is, to me, I kind of look at this as a, All widows are created equal. Some widows are more equal than others. <laughs> um, and then it goes into this conversation about men now, right after that. So Mike says uh, in verse 17, the older men who handle their leadership responsibilities well should be considered worthy of double honor, most of all those who work hard in the proclamation and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is threshing the grain and the worker is worthy of his pay. Do not acknowledge an accusation against an older man unless it is based upon the word of two or three witnesses. If there are, which is really interesting, right? So don't, don't, don't listen to anything about any other man unless it's based on two or three witnesses. But if it's a woman, listen to what I'm saying. Anyway, if there, if there are men who continue to sin, convict them in the presence of anyone in order that they, that the rest will be afraid to sin as they have. I command you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, and of and of the chosen angel messengers that you enforce those regulations with no uh, prejudgment, doing nothing according to favoritism. Do not lay your hands upon anyone too quickly, neither should you participate in their sins of other persons. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and of your numerous digestive problems. <laughs> the sins of some men are obvious, preceding uh, them into certain judgment, and the sins of some are not immediately apparent, but they become apparent later. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and deeds that are not good cannot be concealed. Um, I love the part about the water and the wine. Right. So again, this is talking okay, about, Jesus. but this is this is this 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 to me talks about how you're supposed to be, and there's supposed to be a right way of being. So this is how you're supposed to do it, which of course is very contrary to the nature of grace and of what. Um, um, Jesus came to be and to do, and what Paul actually starts writing to begin with. Okay, so now we have this little bit about slavery as we as we close out this this chapter. Uh, why don't you take chapter six and let's hear what Peterson says? Whoever is a slave must make the best of it, giving respect to his master, so that outsiders don't blame God and our teachings for his behavior. Slaves with Christian masters, all the more so. Their masters are really their beloved brothers. So many of these are the things I want you to teach and preach. If you have leaders there who teach otherwise, who refuse the solid words of our master Jesus and his God instruction, tag them for what they are. Ignorant windbags who infect the air with <laughs> controversy, bad mouthing, suspicious rumors. Eventually, there's an epidemic of backstabbing, and the truth is but a distant memory. They think religion is a way to make a fast buck. A great, a devout life does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless, and we'll leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. But if it's only money these leaders are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Lustful money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to bitterly regret it ever after. Okay, right, we'll pause real quick because a lot of these lessons right here, a lot of these lines in here have been used for stewardship sermons and stewardship series in the church, okay? Which isn't, I mean, it's not bad or anything by any means. Um, but when you start thinking about it from the context of all the other things that we've been reading in Timothy, it's like, how, what do we, how do I take all this? Um, and of course, there's that famous line, verse 10, which yours says definitely different. Um, uh, what, is, what does verse 10 say? 
for the love, love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich. There you go. So some just that, that line for the love of money, and a lot of people think for the love of money is is uh, evil, but it's it's not right. It doesn't right. really say that. For the love of money is the root cause for all of the evils in the world. That in other words, that lusting after um, the material that, um, that that we do right. I mean we. We all pay attention to our money. We pay attention to what we have. We pay attention to what we want. Yeah, those types of things, and yeah. those and those things have the ability to. That's the root cause of all the evil in in the world, which comes from who? Me and my thought and my love of it. You know, I mean, it's part of who I am. I can't. How do I separate those things out? Um, it's interesting. There's a side note in the study Bible uh -huh. that says money is not evil in and of itself. Love of money can draw us away from God and into right. selfish, harmful actions, which I like. I like that it, it, you need money to survive. That's right. the way the world works. Right. Without but if it, that's, if that's all that you're focused on, then all of a sudden you, you do become suspect to right. living in a different way. Verse 11 that we're about to read, um, what I've discovered in, in my study of this briefly was that this is the most... Uh, Pauline language that we have. Verse 11. 611, like finally we get to something that actually sounds most like Paul. But you, O man of God, must stay away from those things. Strive instead for righteousness, godly living, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Just that line in and of that itself. That sounds like something out of Corinthians. Right? Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't really sound like everything else that's been said here so far. Fight the good fight of faith that we share. Cling to the hope of eternal life into which you were called when you were made a good declaration of your faith in the presence of many witnesses. I command you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who made a good declaration of his faith to, uh, to Pontius Pilate to keep the orders that I have given you unspotted and blameless until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will reveal in God's own time God alone has immortality. God alone resides in light, unapproachable. No human being has seen God nor is able to see God. To God be all honor and eternal power, so may it be. Command those who are rich at the present time not to be proud of their riches, nor to put their hope upon certain uncertain wealth, but upon God who supplies all things for us richly for our enjoyment. Command them to do good things for others with their wealth, to be rich in good works, to be generous, sharing what they have, establishing a good foundation for that which is, which is to come, in order that they may take for themselves the life that is truly worth living. O oh, Timothy, guard that which has been entrusted to you, avoiding the profane and empty babbling and contradictions of which is falsely called gnosis. gnosis. Some people, by claiming to be experts in such gnosis, have missed the mark with regard to faith. Grace be with you all. You all might have the word knowledge. Uh, right. Knowledge, which Gnosticism um, uh, uh, it, it was, was something that it was uh, the Gnostics, and um, they were, it, it was like the, the divine truth comes from within, that it's, it's how much we know, um, uh, that type of thing. So this is speaking against that. And Gnosticism was also like uh, the first So where century. does the word agnostic come from? Is that same, um, same, same word? No. So, but no. agnostic, agnostics say that there isn't enough proof that there is a God, correct? Atheist, atheist is, is no God. Agnosticism is, is um, I don't have enough proof yet. That's, yeah. Or I don't I, have enough. I, not, with, without enough knowledge, right? So, knowledge is not, no, Gnostics are, are um, was about the mind uh, being enlightened in that way. Agnostics would be obviously you know, anti of that, so it'd be either not with, without enough knowledge of, of such thing. There's mm -hmm. no faith in that. No faith well, is missing. Right. And I would argue that so I would argue that um, uh, we all, um, at some point in our time in life, and even presently, have issues with belief and knowledge. And that we all have <coughs> practice uh, agnosticism just because of our very nature, which is not a fun thing to be saying as a pastor by any means. But it's, I think it's true because if there's ever been a time where I've only relied on myself and I'm not relying on God, 
but then all of a sudden I'm relying on my own self knowledge, my own self will. That is not, that is no longer believing in a God, it's only believing in self. That's agnostic behavior, that is agnostic thought. Um, it's not, doesn't make me a horrible person. Um, uh, 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 but, but there's no possible way to live up to the standards that we see here, and even in First Timothy and stuff, right? So uh, we all fall short, and if I'm ever relying on myself, then I'm no longer participating in what God's will is for me. Um, I find this whole book Bible or Timothy? Timothy. I'm sorry. First Timothy. I find it so contradictory that it's like, but wait a minute, that isn't what you said back here. Right. And now you're saying this, and that isn't what you said here. It's like the guy's schizophrenic. Well, I think there's there's definitely some of that. And it, I don't know about schizophrenic, but, it's good. <laughs> you know, but I, I get what you're saying, that it seems like it's, it, it's like um, it's spotty. There's not real, there's some, there's, Lack of consistency, except in some aggressiveness um, toward um, female leadership in the church, right? Um, so why why would this book be included in the canon? Well, because it does have some real descriptions of what people who serve the church should be like and how you should choose them. I find value in that, but the rest of the book just kind of like leaves me cold and I'm like, where are you and who are you and whatever happened to you? You know, I mean, that made you so, and, and what I really feel bad about is I think that a lot of what we see in various religions today and in attitudes in the world in general towards women, are reflected in this book and it just makes me kind of wonder yeah I see that there's good in it but why did you include all the rest mm. does that make sense yeah yeah Any, anybody else who were the decision makers on including this yeah male or female? well they were male they were male um, and so because it which conference was it where they put all this together? Was it wasn't nice? Was it Nicaea? When was the Bible? When was the canon established? And that's, I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that and that and I'm I'm running a blank right now. I think it was like about three hundred. Three ninety four, I believe. That's that's, that's ninety. That's Nicaea, I believe. And it, yeah. it was a very different. Like sure. It's really hard to take something from hundreds or thousands of years ago and look at it through today's eyes. We would cut out a lot of stuff. Well, I mean, but that's you know that's that's where we are now. Who knows where we'll go? Three or four generations will be. So what? What I mean, we we've read this and and we know we talked a little about why it might be included in the canon. We also have talked about. Um, the destructive nature of what it, what this letter can and has done, I think. Um, but what does it tell the church to believe or to hope for and then to do? Because it has been included. It does have a purpose in that respect. So what does it tell us to hope for or tell us to believe in or tell us to do? Darlene, what do you think? No thoughts. No thoughts. Okay. That's all right. Amy, what about you? What do you think? I put you on the spot. Uh, um, can you ask me again? I can. So what do you, what do you think? I mean, we've talked a bit, a bit about this letter in um, um, some of the conflict that comes from it, uh, the, the nature of it, um, and, and why it might have been included at the time and, and, and the like, and whether or not it belonged to Paul. But what does it for today, what does it urge the church to believe or to hope for, or what is it calling the church to do? Um, uh, if we were to take that in a 21st century mindset, how does this help today? How does this help today? Well, I think in general, it talks a lot about the roles of individuals. Okay. Um, so maybe in the 
kind of big umbrella kind of thing, we can talk about the roles of individuals in the church. Um, 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 you know, I mean, this talked about the role of individuals in the family. Uh -huh. And then it also talked about the roles of leadership in the church. So, um, and I think that if we looked at this from that, from that perspective then of, of taking out the concept of male or female, because in today's church and in, in this church, even in abiding presence, you know, that isn't the case. Like there is no um, delineation about man can do, woman can do, or shouldn't do, or that kind of thing. In fact, marriage, even the equality of all around. Um, um, so if that's the case, then it, then it speaks greatly to um, um, the different offices of the church and, and how they're, they're to be done so with reverence and, and great attention given to that. Um, it, it, the, the language that, that's spoken in, in, um, in, in a lot of the stuff that I've had to study and read before even becoming a pastor was to be above reproach, um, which is absolutely impossible to get to that place, right? Uh, you can come in. Hi. We're still we're still going at it. So uh, you, you you're a little wet. Did, did, did you been getting rained on? Morning. Uh, Enjoy. You're about to close up at eleven thirty. Is that right? Or you got people coming to pick up? Yes. Do you need anything? You good. Just a little bit. The rest of the kid in the water is all fine. <laughs> Hang in there, buddy. Yeah. I'm gonna say hi. Hi. I'll be back next week. Okay. <laughs> Dry. <laughs> so. Um, uh, but I think this gives us um, a clear um, mindset that, that there are roles that, that leadership takes in the church and roles that servanthood takes in the church and that um, they aren't meant to, to receive glory. They're meant for a purpose. Um, and I think too often in we, because of our humanness, we have the ability to take advantage of that. Um, and, and this person was fearful of women taking advantage, I think. Um, and so it was very clear and very concise, even to the point of widows, you know, about what, what the person should or should not do, which to me says that there was a very scared chauvinistic man writing this letter. Um, however, that being the case, um, because of our humanness, uh, since we're both simultaneously saint and sinner, what good comes from this letter is that there are offices, there are ways of being and at the end of the day, it's, it's try to be Christ-like, you know, out in the world, but also in the places that we gather. For them, it was a house, right? For us, it's a it's a it's a building. Um, and at the end of the day, it's it's just a it's just an outpost, right? It's a gathering spot for us to get together and then go out to the world to do so. Darling, you look like you got something on your heart. Yeah, I like eleven through fifteen. In what chapter? Six. Yes. 6, 11 through 15. Okay. Tell me about it. Uh, it's once again, you know, telling to me, everyone, how they should pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, to which you may give confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is his testimony before Pontius Pilate made a good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment. Is that the one to love? Oh, well, it would be the great commandment, yeah. That's what I guess. That's what I'm guessing. Without spot or blame until manifestation of your Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about in the right time. He who is blessed and only, who, he is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords. To me, that's really um, positive. And it's directing us on how Tell we us should. How to live. Mm -hmm. I believe that first part, like eleven and twelve, are what are used in ordinations. I've heard fight the good fight. Yeah. Yeah. But this might be about the only part I like. Well, and that and that's totally fine, right? And that's okay. And it's okay for us to wrestle with these these books. It's okay to wrestle with these letters for us to look at those and think. I, I do I have to do I have to take this literally and believe every single thing that it says face value and follow it to a T of what it's at you know this tells us about um, this tells us about God I mean that's I don't believe in the Bible I don't believe in the, this this that, that, but it gives me a, a wonderful roadmap on how to gain my faith in, in, in God and in Christ in, in, in spirit 
Um, I, I believe in, in, in the character that it tells me about God. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, my faith is not in a book. It's in, it's in, it's in, it's in God, who is much greater than I am. And that whenever I put my, my faith and in, in my belief and my power in that, all of a sudden, amazing things happen. I'm able to live a life that's, uh, that's very blessed and, and, uh, and serene. And, uh, and for me, that goes above and beyond any letter or, or, or book that's inside the Bible. Next week, you're going to be looking at 2 Timothy, which, of course, was written before 1 Timothy. Um, and it's different. And you're going to have some different language in there, too, as well. So you're going to hear some different things. But that way, you'll, you'll, we'll have culmination of all these different pastoral epistles. And remember, these were written for these house churches to explain how to operate, how to begin Christ, you know, the, the beginning of church and stuff. Acts, of course, tells us a lot about what the first church did and how they operated together as a people. But now we're getting a little bit more into the different offices that happen in there, which I think is really interesting. Well, and they're becoming far more spread right. around the world as they knew it. It's not as easy to get the word out. You know, they, they have to rely on letters and notes and that to get, because they're just becoming more far flung. And even in Ephesus, which is where Timothy was, it wasn't just one right. house church. No. There, there were, Did they know of the other house churches, or was it still kind of, you know, for safety reasons, secret? Um, at this point in time, I think there would have been a little bit more knowledge um, of, of what's going on. Yeah. Letters get 